Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, apparently, someone already took the joke about the Jewish guy in a church on Shabbat. So I'm, I'm not going to say that one. Um, having a little, little trouble getting used to it. I was told at the very last minute that, this is, that uh, the theme is graphic. And so I didn't bring anything graphic in my talk. I was just after getting into Chicago, I was told I had to have some graphic element to my talk, so I inserted some graphic language. Um, <laughs> it'll come up later. OK, um, got to start with some humor, because this gets a little depressing very quickly. Donald Trump's election raised a question that Daniel Ziblatt, my co-author, and I never thought that we would ever ask. Could American democracy be in danger? Like most Americans, we had always taken the stability of our democracy for for granted, and there were good reasons for this. No democracy as rich or as old as America's has ever broken down. And yet Trump's election seemed to place us in uncharted territory. In his classic book, The Breakdown of Democratic Regimes, the Spanish political scientist, Juan Linz, devised what he called a litmus test to identify authoritarians before they come to power. It seems like a useful thing. So we presented kind of a refined version of that litmus test in our book. And Donald Trump tested unambiguously positive on the test during the 2016 campaign, checked every box. He suggested that he might not abide by the results of the elections. He threatened legal action against critics in the media. He threatened to lock up his opponent. And he condoned and even encouraged violence. No major party presidential candidate in modern American history has ever behaved that way. But Daniel and I had seen politicians behave that way. Daniel and his work on interwar Europe, me and my work on Latin America. So watching the 2016 campaign unfold had both of us feeling like we'd seen this movie before. And it's a movie that does not end well. So we decided to write a book, one that tries to draw lessons from democracies, other democracies in crisis, some of which survived these crises, some of which didn't, and try to apply those lessons to the United States. So how do democracies die? Well, they don't die like they used to. Democracies used to die at the hands of men with guns. During the Cold War, three out of every four democratic breakdowns took the form of a classic military coup. The general seized power. Contemporary democracies die in more subtle ways. They die at the hands not of generals, but of elected presidents and prime ministers, leaders who use the very institutions of democracy to subvert it. So democracies die constitutionally. They die through elections, through referenda and plebiscites. They die through parliamentary legislation. They die through Supreme Court rulings. As a result, citizens aren't always aware that their country is sliding into authoritarianism, sometimes until it's too late. So in 2011, for example, uh, 12 years into Hugo Chavez's presidency, a majority of Venezuelans, according to surveys, still believe they were living under a democracy. Same is true in Turkey, a decade into the AKP's rule. Same is true in Hungary and Poland today. So if democratic breakdown begins at the ballot box, one of the keys to protecting democracy lies in keeping extremists and demagogues from getting elected in the first place. And here, political parties play a central role. Parties are democracy's gatekeepers. Because they're the ones who select the candidates, they have the power to keep extremists and demagogues out. It's when parties fail to play this gatekeeping role that democracy gets into trouble. Elected authoritarians very rarely make it into power on their own. Almost always, they get an assist, a helping hand, from mainstream political parties. Mainstream parties, particularly ones that maybe are uh, not doing very well politically, are often tempted to strike kind of a Faustian bargain with popular demagogues. They align with them, they work with them in the hope of tapping into their popular support, but also in the belief that ultimately they can control them. But this bargain often backfires. In Italy in the 1920s, liberal leader Giovanni Gioletti, uh, trying to tap into Mussolini's mass appeal, included the fascists on his liberal party candidate list. That helped to normalize Mussolini. It opened the door to his rise to power. In Weimar, Germany, the leader of the German Conservative Party forged a loose alliance with Hitler as early as the 1920s, trying to draw on Hitler's grassroots appeal to shore up his party's declining base. The strategy only served 
to legitimize Hitler. In early 1933, when conservative leader Franz von Papen tried to ease the, uh, the concerns of many of his conservative allies about Hitler's appointment as chancellor, he told his conservative allies, don't worry, within two months, will have pushed him in so far into a corner, he will squeal. In both of these cases, mainstream party leaders, driven by short-term political ambitions, abandoned their gatekeeping role and led extremists in the door. In both cases, turned out to be tragic miscalculation. Now, historically, American parties have done a pretty good job of gatekeeping. It is not true that the United States is not, that has, has, has been free of extremist demagogues of the, of the left and of the right. We've had our fair share of demagogues. Father Coughlin, Henry Ford, Huey Long, Joe McCarthy, George Wallace. Surveys suggest, ones that go back to the, to the 20s and 30s, that each of these figures enjoyed an approval rating of somewhere in the range of 30, even 35 percent, which is not far from Donald Trump's support base. But none of these figures that I just listed ever made it close to the presidency. And what kept them out was the candidate selection process. Prior to 1972, American presidential candidates were selected by party leaders in party conventions, what we often think of as uh, smoke-filled back rooms. That system was not very transparent. It was not very inclusive. It was not very democratic. But it was a pretty effective filtering mechanism. Party leaders acted as gatekeepers, engaging in what political scientists at the time called a process of peer review. What they meant was that party leaders had worked closely with all of the potential candidates. They knew their strengths. They knew their weaknesses. They knew how the candidates dealt with strength, oh, excuse me, with the stress, with adversity. And they knew which of the potential candidates was a demagogue. In fact, for all of its shortcomings, and there were many real shortcomings, the old convention system had a perfect record, perfect record in keeping demagogues out. Under the old convention system, it was impossible for an outsider like Henry Ford or a demagogue like Huey Long to be nominated by a major political party. So most of them never even tried. How many of you have read um, Philip Roth's book, The Plot Against America? If you, not enough. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's a great book. In that story, Charles Lindbergh, a Nazi sympathizer, Capture, sweeps in and captures the 1940 Republican nomination, goes on to beat FDR and win the presidency. Um, things go downhill from there. That story seems all too imaginable today after Trump's election, which, and book sales have skyrocketed as a result. But back in 1940, that was unthinkable. Lindbergh's candidacy never would have made it through the party gatekeepers, never would have gotten out of the smoke-filled rooms. So what happened in 2016? First of all, American parties adopted a system of binding primaries in 1972. The primary system is far more open, far more transparent, far more democratic than the system that it replaced. But it weakened party leaders' role as gatekeepers. Now, if a demagogue like Henry Ford or Charles Lindbergh ran for office, it would be harder to keep them out. There are fewer obstacles. And that's what we saw in 2016. In many senses, Donald Trump was the Henry Ford of his day. Henry Ford wanted to be president. Henry Ford had a lot of popular support in the heartland. He, want, he thought seriously about running for president in 1923 in the 24 race. But he realized that he had no chance, that, the, that his party, the Democratic Party, was never going to open the door to him. Um, but whereas party gatekeepers kept Ford far from the presidency, Trump found the gates wide open. But even after Trump's nomination, Republican gatekeepers failed a second time. Juan Linz, the guy who came up with that um, litmus test for authoritarians, spent his, most of his career studying how and why democracies break down. He was born in Weimar, Germany. He grew up during the Spanish Civil War in Spain. Um, so this question had a lot of importance to him. He really he devoted his life to figuring out how to prevent democracies from dying. And one of the key lessons that Linz and others took from the failure of democracy in interwar Europe was that when would-be authoritarians emerge on the stage, mainstream parties and mainstream politicians have to do everything possible 
to keep them away from the center of powers, including making great political sacrifices. Now, resisting a demagogue on one's own side of the political spectrum is hard. You risk angering the base. Nobody likes to anger the base. And it often means short-term political defeat. No politician likes to lose. So politicians often rationalize. They tell themselves, eh, the demagogue might not be so bad. They believe, or they, they rationalize to themselves that they can control him once he's in office. And that in any event, he's better than, the ideo than, than having the, their ideological rivals in office. Again, this is a terrible mistake. Linz made the point forcefully. When faced with a would-be authoritarian, he writes, politicians must, and I quote, join with opponents ideologically distinct but committed to the survival of the democratic political order. You must join with allies. You must make alliances with people on the other side of the aisle in defense of democracy. That's the central lesson that Linz drew from interwar Europe. Some Republicans did precisely that in 2016. Listen to what three Republican politicians said during the 2016 campaign. Republican number one, our choice this election could not be more clear. Hillary Clinton is a strong and clear supporter of American democracy. Donald Trump is a danger for our democracy. Republican two, it's time to put our country before party and vote for Secretary Clinton. Trump is too dangerous and too unfit to hold our nation's highest office. Republican three, this is serious stuff, and I won't waste my vote on a protest candidate. Since the future of the country may depend on preventing Donald Trump from becoming president, I'm with Clinton this November, and I urge Republicans to join me. Had those three statements been made by Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, former President George W. Bush, or perhaps a trio of prominent senators like McCain, Rubio, Cruz, the outcome of the 2016 election would have been very different. Alas, the statements were not made by prominent Republicans. The first one was made by William A. Pierce, the former press secretary of former Maine Senator Olympia Snow. The second one was made by Jack McGregor, a former state senator from Pennsylvania. The third by Rick Stoddard, a Republican banker from Denver. Ryan McConnell, Rubio Cruz all endorsed Trump. McCain withdrew his endorsement but refused to support Hillary Clinton. Bush remained silent. Republican leaders in private knew that Donald Trump was a demagogue. They're not stupid. They knew damn well he was unfit for office. There goes the graphic language. <laughs> Just my point. But, but no major Republican leader was willing to do the one thing that would have ensured, that Trump, that would have ensured Trump's defeat, and that is endorse Hillary Clinton. Not a single prominent Republican official across the country endorsed Clinton. No governors, no senators, one Republican member of Congress, and he was retiring. That sent a powerful, crystal clear signal to Republican voters. It told Republican voters that Trump was an acceptable candidate and that this was a normal election. That turned the election, the 2016 election, into a standard two-party race. In the context of a so-so economy, middling presidential popularity, a standard two-party race in this country can go either way. And of course, it went Trump's way. So now, for the first time in more than a century, we have a sitting president with a demonstrably weak commitment to constitutional and democratic norms. That's where our institutions come into play. Americans place a lot of faith in our Constitution, in our constitutional system, and for very good reason. We have the oldest, the most successful Constitution in the world, uh, and our system of checks and balances has, in fact, contained many powerful and ambitious presidents in the past. Andrew Jackson, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Nixon. Why should it not contain Trump? It might. But one of the core messages of our book is that the Constitution by itself is not enough to save us. Constitutions are never self-enacting. They don't work automatically. If they worked automatically, then Argentina, whose Constitution in the 19th century was nearly an exact replica of ours, 
would have been a stable democracy in the 20th century. Instead, it suffered six military coups. Same constitution, very different outcome. Constitutions work best when they're reinforced by robust democratic norms, unwritten rules. Our book focuses on two of these unwritten rules in particular, two norms in particular. The first is what we call mutual toleration, or accepting the legitimacy of our partisan opponents. That means that no matter how much we disagree with our rivals, no matter how much we may dislike our rivals, we recognize both publicly and in private that they are loyal citizens who love the country as much as we do and crucially have an equal, legitimate right to compete against us and if they beat us, to govern us. In other words, we do not treat our rivals as enemies. Second norm, a little bit more complicated, is what we call institutional forbearance. Forbearance means refraining from exercising one's legal right. It is an act of self-restraint. It's an underutilization of power. We don't think about restraint and forbearance very often in politics, but it's absolutely vital. Think about what the President of the United States is constitutionally able to do. The President can pardon whomever she wants, whenever she wants. I'm still in denial. Um, <laughs> the president can pardon whomever she wants, whenever she wants. Pre any president with a majority in Congress can pack the Supreme Court. Don't like how the Supreme Court is ruling, don't like the ideological composition of the court. If you have a majority in Congress, you can pass legislation, expand it to 11, to 13, and fill it with ideological allies, perfectly legal. If a president's agenda is, is stalled in Congress, he or she can circumvent the legislative process and make policy through presidential proclamations, executive orders, and other forms of decree. The Constitution does not explicitly prohibit such action. Or think about what Congress could do. The Senate could use its, right, its constitutional right of advice and consent to block every single one of the president's cabinet appointments, every single one of the president's judicial appointments. It can refuse to, to allow the president to fill a Supreme Court vacancy. Congress can refuse to fund the government. It can effectively shut the government down. And of course, it can impeach the president on virtually any grounds it chooses. My point here is that politicians can exploit the letter of the Constitution, even our brilliantly designed Constitution, in ways that totally eviscerate its spirit and threaten democracy. Legal scholar Mark Tushnet calls this sort of behavior constitutional hardball, using the letter of the law in ways that undermine the spirit of the law. Look at any failing or failed democracy across the world, and you'll find an abundance of constitutional hardball. Argentina under Perón, Spain and Germany in the 30s, Venezuela under Chavez, contemporary Hungary, Poland, Turkey. Constitutional hardball is how even a brilliantly designed system of checks and balances can be subverted. Let me take an example of a country I know, Argentina. Again, Argentina's 1853 constitution was modeled explicitly on ours. One study found that two-thirds of the Argentine constitution was, was essentially plagiarized, word for word, from the United States. That was not enough to check Juan Perón. One of the first moves that Perón made after, winning, after becoming president in 1946 was to have Congress impeach three out of five Supreme Court justices on grounds of malfeasance, a move that was technically constitutional. The Peronist Congress then passed a law making it a crime to disrespect the president, to engage in you know, fake news. When opposition leader Ricardo Balbín was arrested under this new law because he said something against the government, he challenged the law's constitutionality in, in, in the Supreme Court. Makes sense. The Supreme Court was packed, though, and so it ruled against him. He spent a few years in jail. All of that was legal. What prevents a constitutional system of checks and balances from descending into the kind of constitutional hardball that can wreck a democracy is forbearance. It's a shared commitment among politicians to exercising restraint in deploying one's institutional prerogatives. It's a commitment to ensuring that the spirit of the law prevails over the letter of the law. Think about presidential term limits historically in the United States. Prior to 1951, the US Constitution placed, 
placed no limits on presidential reelection. Legally, US, if they could get reelected, U.S. presidents could be president for life, like Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. Yet George Washington stepped down after two terms, and after that, for nearly 150 years, no president sought a third term. Even very popular, ambitious presidents like Jefferson, Jackson, Grant, refrained from seeking a third term. It was an unwritten rule of self-restraint. Or take the filibuster, another example of forbearance. Technically, a Senate minority can use the filibuster to block every single piece of legislation put forward by the majority, can make it impossible for the majority to govern. But historically, the filibuster was very rarely used in the United States. It was widely understood by all politicians to, to be a procedural weapon of last resort. Between 1917 and 1960, there was an average of uh, fewer than one filibuster per year in the United States, or 30 over this 43-year period. Norms of mutual toleration and forbearance serve as what Daniel and I call the soft guardrails of democracy. They are what help prevent healthy political competition from spiraling into the kind of partisan fight to the death that wrecked democracies in Europe in the 1930s and in South America in the 1960s and 70s. Now, American democracy has not always had soft guardrails. It wasn't born with them. Uh, our founding fathers actually never quite got the concept of mutual toleration. That's because um, this, the idea of a legitimate opposition party was just emerging in the West at this time in the late 18th century. So our founding fathers, brilliant as they were, didn't quite wrap their heads around that. So under President uh, Washington, under President Adams, the ruling Federalist Party viewed the emerging Jeffersonian opposition as seditious, viewed them as secretly working for revolutionary France. Jeffersonians were not much better. They viewed the Federalists as monarchists who were conspiring to bring back British rule, so pretty, pretty hostile. Both sides engaged in destabilizing acts of constitutional hardball, hardball that almost wrecked the republic before it, it, it took roots. Uh, as all of you know, the Adams administration passed the Sedition Act, which came close to outlawing opposition. And both Adams and then Jefferson engaged in egregious instances of court. Really, it was not until the post-revolutionary generation, the Van Buren generation, that mutual toleration really took hold in the United States. It didn't last long. In the 1850s, Southern Democrats came to view the new Republican Party as an existential threat because the Republicans were anti-slavery. Um, and both parties during this period, as, as conflict over slavery intensified in the 1850s, both parties viewed each other as traitors to the Republic. Georgia Senator Robert Coombs, Democrat, vowed, and I quote, to never permit this federal government to pass into the traitorous hands of the black Republican Party. As basic norms eroded over the course of the 1850s, the guardrails, the newly emergent guardrails, broke down. Politics took on an anything goes character. One historian counts 125 different acts of violence on the floor of Congress. Fist fights, canings, stabbings in the decades running up to World War, excuse me, Civil War. Mutual toleration obviously collapsed during the Civil War. It remained very low for nearly a generation after the Civil War. During Reconstruction, Senate Democrats continued to view the Republicans as an existential threat. And the Republicans continued to view the Democrats as traitors. The late 1860s, early 1970s were replete, replete with hardball politics. Some of it constitutional, not all of it constitutional. There were changes to the size of the Supreme Court, essentially court packing in 1866 and 1869. There was an impeachment of President Johnson in uh, 1868, and there was a fraudulent election in 1876. So things were pretty rough. It was only in the, 19, in the 1880s that the two parties began to play nice. And tragically, they only did so after the Republican, uh, the Republican Party abandoned the goal of racial equality, abandoned Reconstruction, and allowed Southern Democrats to disenfranchise blacks and establish Jim Crow and single party rule in the South. Once the Republican Party backed off racial equality, Democrats stopped seeing them as an existential threat. And the two parties 
began to tolerate and to cooperate with one another. This is an important point. It's a sad point, but an important one. The norms of mutual toleration and forbearance that I'm going to argue served as a foundation for American democracy in the 20th century emerged originally out of a profoundly undemocratic arrangement, racial exclusion and the establishment of single party rule in the South. That said, beginning in the late 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, Democrats and Republicans did in fact accept one another as legitimate, did in fact, I'm starting to lose, uh, okay, accepted one another as legitimate and avoided destabilizing acts of constitutional hardball. There were no impeachments, no successful court packings. Senators were pretty judicious in their use of filibusters and in their use of uh, the right of advice and consent on presidential appointments. The Senate generally deferred to the president. And outside of wartime, presidents refrained from acting unilaterally to circumvent the courts or to circumvent Congress. So for more than a century, from the late 19th century through the late 20th century, our system of checks and balances worked. It worked quite well. But again, it worked because it was reinforced by norms of mutual toleration and forbearance. Our book argues that America's democratic norms have been unraveling over the last quarter century. There were signs of this beginning in the early 1990s. Newt Gingrich, who became Republican House Speaker in 1995, instructed his Republican legislative allies starting in the 80s to use terms like betray, anti-flag, anti-family, traitor to describe Democrats. Gingrich was also a master of constitutional hardball. He engineered the first major government shutdown of the modern era in 1995. Basically, the idea was, if the president doesn't give us what we want, we will stop funding the government. We'll just shut it down. Legal, pretty reckless. Three years later, the Republican House carried out a nakedly partisan impeachment of Bill Clinton, basically on a technicality. It was the first impeachment in 130 years. The process of norm erosion really accelerated, though, in the early 21st century. During the Obama era, the Tea Party movement radicalized the Republicans and encouraged, pushed them increasingly to abandon mutual toleration. So Republican leaders like Gingrich, Sarah Palin, Mike Huckabee, Rudy Giuliani, told their followers over and over again that President Obama did not love America, that Obama and the Democrats were not real Americans. The birther movement, including Donald Trump, went a step further, of course. They questioned whether President Obama was even born in the United States and therefore challenged the very legitimacy of Barack Obama as president. Just to give you one quote, Colorado Congressman Mike Kaufman declared at one point to his followers, I do not know if Barack Obama was born in the United States, but I do know this. In his heart, he's not an American. He's just not an American. Hillary Clinton received similar treatment. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump repeatedly called her a criminal, and Republicans chanted, lock her up live on national television during the convention. Now, America has always had an extremist fringe, but this wasn't fringe politics any longer. These were national Republican leaders. This was the Republican Party's 2012 vice presidential candidate. This was the party's 2016 presidential candidate. It was the National Republican Convention on primetime television. Leading Republicans now, for the first time in more than a century, were denying the legitimacy of their Democratic rivals. That worries us, worries us a lot, because what we've learned studying democracies elsewhere is that in the absence of mutual toleration, in the absence of this willingness to accept the publicly and privately the legitimacy of your rivals, Politicians are encouraged to abandon forbearance and to engage in an escalating spiral of constitutional hardball. When we view our partisan rivals as enemies, when we view them as anti-American, when we view them as an existential threat to us, we grow tempted naturally to use any means necessary to beat them. And that's exactly what is beginning to happen. Politicians have started to throw forbearance to the wind. So when Republicans won control of Congress in 2010, they adopted publicly a strategy of outright obstructionism. They basically sought to ruin Obama's presidency in order to win 
in 2012. Filibuster use, which had been rising for decades, reached an all-time high during the Obama administration. There were more filibusters during Obama's second term, four years, than in all the years between World War I and, this, and the end of the Reagan presidency combined. President Obama responded with constitutional hardball of his own when Congress refused to pass immigration reform, when Congress refused to, to pass climate change legislation, he circumvented it via executive orders. That action was technically legal, but it clearly violated the spirit of the Constitution. By the end of the Obama presidency, Republicans in particular seemed willing to adopt any means necessary to prevent Democrats from winning. 15 states, every single one of them Republican, adopted strict voter ID laws between 2010 and 2016 that were clearly aimed at dampening turnout among low-income and non-white voters. In North Carolina, after the Democrats won the governorship in 2016, the Republican legislature held a surprise special session and passed a slew of laws aimed at weakening the new government, changing the rules to handicap the new government. So they packed the local election boards. They granted nearly 1,000 Republican appointees tenure in, in government positions so the, the new government couldn't remove them. Uh, and they reduced the size of the state appeals court by two, essentially stealing two court seats from the new governor. Most stunning of all, though, at least in my view, was the Senate's decision in 2016 to not allow President Obama to fill the Supreme Court vacancy created by Justice Scalia's death. This was a move that was unprecedented since 1866. Why are, why are we cheering that? I, I don't get it. Unprecedented since 1866. All of that, all the things I just mentioned, occurred before Donald Trump was elected president, before he became president. So the problem is not just that Americans elected a demagogue in 2016. We did do that. The problem is that we elected a demagogue at a time when the soft guardrails protecting our democracy are becoming unmoored. So why the hell is this happening? More graphic language. Our norms, we argue in the book, are being shredded by polarization. Over the last 25 years, Republicans and Democrats have come truly to fear and loathe one another. In 1960, 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats, according to surveys, said they would be unhappy if their kid married someone from the other party. 5%. Today, the number is 50%. According to a recent Pew survey last year, 45% of Republicans, 41% of Democrats say the other party's policies threaten the nation's well-being. That's not just opposition. 49% of Republicans and 55% of Democrats say the other party makes them afraid. We have not seen this kind of partisan fear and hatred since the end of Reconstruction. And this is not just traditional liberal conservative polarization. People do not fear and loathe one another over taxes. They don't fear and loathe one another over health care reform. They just don't. Today's partisan differences run deeper than that. They're about race, religion, and way of life. Our parties have changed dramatically. The names haven't changed, but they've changed dramatically over the last 50 years, over my lifetime. Back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party differed on a bunch of issues, but they were demographically and culturally almost identical. They overlapped. Both parties were overwhelmingly white and Christian. Three changes have occurred over the last half century. First of all, the Civil Rights Movement led to a massive migration of Southern whites from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. At the same time, the enfranchisement of African Americans in the South um, uh, and the Civil Rights Movement pushed uh, African Americans overwhelmingly into the Democratic Party. Second, U.S. experienced a massive wave of immigration. Those immigrants and their kids have ended up in the Democratic Party. And third, since Reagan, white evangelical Christians have moved uh, from a point in the 1970s where they were evenly distributed to, between the two parties, they've passed overwhelmingly into the Republican Party. So what does that mean? That means that today, the Democrats and Republicans are culturally and racially very, very distinct. The Democrats are sort of a rainbow coalition of urban, educated, mostly secular whites and a, and, and a uh, range of ethnic minorities. The Republicans, by contrast, remain pretty much what they were 
back in the 1970s, an overwhelmingly white Christian party. That's important because white Christians are not just any group. Not only were they once a pretty solid electoral majority, but they used to sit unchallenged atop this country's social, economic, political, cultural hierarchies. What does that mean? They filled the presidency. They filled Congress. They filled the Supreme Court. They filled the governor's mansions. They were the pillars of local communities. They were the CEOs. They were the newscasters, the movie stars, the college professors. They were the face of both the Democratic and Republican Party. Those days obviously are over. But losing a majority, and more importantly, losing one's dominant social status can be deeply threatening. Many Republican voters, not all, many Republican voters feel like the country that they grew up in is being taken away from them. And that, we think, is what ultimately fueling polarization. The problem is that extreme polarization can kill democracies. This is a major lesson from the failure of democracy in Europe in the 1930s, from South America in the 1960s and 70s. When politics is so deeply polarized that each side comes to view a victory by the other side as intolerable, as beyond the pale, democracy is in trouble, it's imperiled. Because when an opposition victory is seen as intolerable, you start to justify using extraordinary means to prevent it. Things like violence, election fraud, even coups. Americans have not reached that point. But we have reached a point where, according to exit polls in 2016, one in four Trump voters, one in four Trump voters, believed that Donald Trump was unfit for the presidency of the United States. One out of four Trump voters did not believe that the man they were voting for was fit to occupy the presidency of the United States, and yet they still preferred him to the Democrat. We've reached a point where, according to Gallup polls over the last year and a half, Republicans have a much more favorable view of Vladimir Putin than of Hillary Clinton. Those are dangerous levels of polarization. Donald Trump is a symptom of that polarization. He did not cause it, and his departure will not put an end to it. So what can be done? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> if I did, I would have a much better paying job. Couple of things. First of all, it is clear the Republican Party has to change. It has to become a more diverse political party. As long as it remains an overwhelmingly white Christian party in a society as diverse as ours, it will be prone to polarizing white nationalist appeals, white nationalist extremism. That change, I think, will happen. It's a question of when and how much damage occurs in the meantime. In terms of what Democrats can do, and this gets a little trickier, gets me a little more criticism, there's been a lot of talk in progressive circles in the last year about Democrats learning how to fight like Republicans. If Republicans are going to play constitutional hardball, the argument goes, then Democrats need to play tit for tat. If they don't, they will be victims of an endless series of sucker punches, right? Stolen Supreme Court seats and the like. And Democrats are, in fact, learning how to fight like Republicans. Just a few months ago, they used a filibuster to trigger their, their very own first major government shutdown right out of the Newt Gingrich playbook. Many Democrats are running on a platform of impeachment this year. And if Democrats win control of the Senate, which is possible, there's talk among Democrats of denying President Trump the ability to fill any Supreme Court vacancy should one emerge, just like the Republicans did to Obama. We think this is a terrible idea. If Democrats respond with constitutional hardball, that, one, that one's worth applauding for. If Democrats respond with constitutional hardball, it will almost certainly reinforce and even accelerate the process of norm erosion that we are currently suffering. In other words, it will further corrode our democratic guardrails. And in our experience studying failing and failed democracies elsewhere, that sort of escalation, that sort of spiraling norm erosion rarely ends well. A couple of things that Democrats can do. One is take steps to reduce inequality. Levels of income inequality today are higher than at any time since before the Great Depression. Between 1975 and 2015, the bottom 40% of American society 
saw its incomes stagnate. No improvement over 40 years for almost half of this country. At the same time, the top 5% saw its income nearly double. There's no question that growing inequality has contributed both to polarization and to the rise of right-wing populism in this country. Because populism in this country, when it emerges, because of our racial diversity, is always right-wing. The Democratic Party basically stopped fighting inequality in the early 1990s. It has largely abandoned issues of redistribution. Remember the trouble that Barack Obama got in with Plumber Joe when he talked about sharing the wealth? Democrats have learned, have learned to run away from redistribution like the plague since the Bill Clinton era. It should take up issues of redistribution again. Our democracy may depend on it. One way. You guys are going to have me run for office. I, I never, I've never gotten applause lines before. <laughs> Another way of reducing polarization is to increase turnout, to get everyone to vote. Um, for a long time, so we've always had a problem of low turnout in the United States. For a long time, political scientists didn't worry about it very much. We kind of pointed to surveys that showed that, well, the attitudes of the people who vote are kind of similar to the people who don't vote, so it doesn't really matter very much that only half the country votes. More recently, evidence suggests something very different. It suggests that the Americans who are voting are those who are politically most polarized, most committed and most polarized. Those who stay home are the people who don't care very much about politics. That really matters. Democracy needs those people. Democracy needs the people who don't care very much about politics for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is they tend to have a moderating effect on elections. They tend to combat polarization. If only the people who care really intensely in this polarized environment vote, you're going to get polarizing outcomes. Our democratic institutions may well survive the Trump era. I think they likely will muddle through the Trump era. My guess is that barring a major war or terrorist attack, and that is what keeps me up at night, our democracy will survive. But we cannot take American democracy for granted. That's something we've done for far too long. It is true that no democracy, even remotely as wealthy or as old as ours, has ever broken down. And that should give us some cause for, for hope. But it's also true, I think, that we are in uncharted territory for several reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, levels of income inequality today are higher than any time since the 20s. Secondly, maybe even more importantly, We've begun a transition that, to my knowledge, no democracy has ever successfully undergone, one in which a previously dominant ethnic group loses its majority status. Now, we may well be the first democracy to do that, to get there successfully, but to get to the other side, we're going to have to pass through a period of intense and polarizing reaction. We're there right now. During this moment of polarization, we cannot afford to be reckless with our institutions. We have far, far too much to lose. I believe I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Just a reminder that Mr. Levitsky's book, How Democracies Die, is on sale in the lobby. And he'll be signing books on the second floor following this brief Q&A session. We've got one microphone down here with me and one in the balcony with Diane. We'll start down here and bounce up and down. We'll get as many questions in as we can. Okay. Here and then here. How do you respond to the new studies that have come out that have shown that the so-called free democracies are losing percent of global GDP and that that is going to destroy the institutions no matter what goes on internally? That, losing their share of global GDP? Well, I think inevitably we, we're in a process of global realignment. I mean, the, the, the rise of China and of much of Asia, the economic rise of China and much of Asia is, I think, inevitable. It's, it's in, unstoppable. Um, it, it was inevitable that the United States enjoyed a brief period, a brief restoration of hegemony in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that felt great, right? The US was the liberal democracy and Western capitalism were the only game in town. The US and Europe were the dominant 
economic, military, ideological power on Earth. That was not going to last under any circumstance. Um, I don't think, so, so that seems incontrovertible, that, that, that the Western share of global GDP is going to shrink. That doesn't mean that absolute levels of wealth will shrink at all. So absolute levels of wealth can continue to grow. And as long as Western democracies uh, retain it, uh, decent living standards, and I would add reasonably equitable um, distribution of wealth, there's no, even if China becomes richer than we are, as long as we are healthy as a society, there's no reason to think that democracy in the West will fail. Question up in the balcony. Uh, yes, so you're talking about how we might be able to alter this in America, but it is a global phenomenon, Hungary, Turkey, Czechoslovakia, you name it, Poland. So we're fighting a global phenomenon and it's globally the cities versus the rural areas and technology is supercharging the cities, the rural areas being left behind. That's not gonna change. Technology's gonna continue to change that. So it's hopeless. <laughs> it's not hopeless. So um, this global democratic recession that we're told about, um, Polity 4, which is one of the more reputable indices, global indices of democracy, uh, you know, counts the number of, of democracies in the world each year. Uh, at the, the, when everyone agrees that the, the peak of democracy was in around the year 2005, 2006, and that's when the vaunted global democratic recession, Turkey and Russia and Hungary and Venezuela, when, that's when the recession started in. If you look at the data, according to Polity 4, the number of democracies in the world at that peak democracy period, 2005, 2006, 70. How many democracies in the world today, according to, to Polity 4? 70. There is not evidence yet of a global democratic recession. We pay a lot of attention, for good reason, to Thailand and Venezuela and Hungary and Poland uh, and Turkey, because it's awful when democracies break down. But there have been, over the last 10, 15 years, an equal number of countries that have moved into the category of democracy, whether it's Sri Lanka or Tunisia or Senegal or the Gambia. So the actual net change globally is minimal. This is not to say there aren't storm clouds on the horizon, but so far, the democratic sky is not falling. The, the point you make about technological change and cities versus countryside, absolutely right. Um, polities, even democracies, have responded to large-scale, radical technological and economic change in the past. Western democracies, and they were challenged. In some cases, they broke down. But I don't think it's inevitable that ever that technological and economic change lead to political change. Politicians, governments, elites, academics need to learn how to adapt. They're going to have to adapt social policy, have to adapt economic policy to this new world. If we don't begin to think about providing opportunities to those who are losing out under globalization, who are losing out due to technological change, as you pointed out, then yes, we're in trouble. But politicians can learn. Look at this, I'm turning out to be the optimist in the room. Over here, main floor. So I have a question. What do you imagine will be with the United States worst case scenario <laughs> if Donald Trump will be president for eight years? It's basically about the title of your book. Uh, great question. What's the worst case scenario? So let me, let me just throw something out here. Political science models show that Trump's got about a 50-50 chance of re-election. So it could happen. I disagree with some of my colleagues. I, I don't know how many of you have read um, uh, Timothy Snyder's books, which are really gloomy. Um, I don't think fascism is around the corner. I don't think the worst case scenario is a military coup or fascism or single party rule. I think there are very, very good reasons to think that the worst case scenario is, is not, it does not look like 1930s Europe. We have a very strong private sector, a very strong civil society, a very strong opposition. The di a major difference between, say, Hungary and Russia on the one hand and the United States on the other hand is we have a really strong opposition party. And we've actually seen that over the last 18 months. Um, what's the worst case scenario? I think there are two 
two bad scenarios. Um, one is, is the one in which the Republicans continue to win elections, which is possible, because Republicans now, because of the way that voters are distributed geographically, so this, this one's not the Republicans' fault, but the interaction of our electoral rules and the way folks are distributed geographically, the Republicans have a built-in advantage, especially in the Senate, but also in the Electoral College and to a small extent in the House. Um, so it's possible that Democrats can continue to win the popular vote and lose elections systematically. If the Republicans win in 2018, 2020, um, what could happen? The, I would say the worst case scenario is that they are able to, one, you know, pack the judiciary in, in, a, in, a, in a massive way, uh, legally, legally pack, I should say, fill the judiciary with conservatives. Um, and I would say in the worst case, advance in, what, what scares me the most about the Republicans' political project is this anti-voter fraud campaign. It's efforts to make it harder for people to vote, which is inherently among the most undemocratic things you can imagine, but it's particularly pernicious now because not only does it affect lower income and particularly non-white voters, but that's the, that's the electoral base of the Democratic Party. So if the Republican Party were able to advance, and it could only do this if it really controlled the judiciary and controlled legislatures, were to advance in this project of making it significantly harder to, for poor and non-white voters to vote, you could see the playing field tilt to the Republican Party. I think that's the worst case scenario. Well, this is what I, um, the, the, the term that, that Don asked me to repeat five times. The book I wrote about competitive authoritarianism is that. It's a, it's a type of regime in which democratic institutions, Congress, Constitution, elections, continue to exist, but the playing field is tilted. That, that could happen. The, uh, the more likely scenario is something like North Carolina, just a constant, persistent constitutional hardball, where institutions are used as weapons against the other side, and which things are very destabilizing. We sort of swing in and out of crisis, constitutional crisis, policy dysfunctionality, just a politics that doesn't work. I think that is a much more likely scenario. There's a question in the balcony. You said, you explained that the Argentine constitution almost mimics the American one. It did. Uh, however, there is one issue, the, the fact that the Argentine constitution expressly benefits or in, enhances one religion how much of a difference is that? Could that have been the seed of the different paths that the two countries took? Uh, I mean, that's a long, the, the, the failure of Argentine democracy is a long story that you don't want to hear me ramble on about now. Um, at the time, Argentina was both a homogeneously Catholic population and a relatively secular population. So I actually don't think that that was crucial. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't have time to get into why I think Argentina went, went a different way. But interestingly, Argentina changed its constitution in 1994, uh, got rid of that uh, monopoly granted to the Catholic Church, and also got rid of the Electoral College, um, which is something we haven't managed to do here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a subject for a longer debate, but I, I don't think it was religion. Main floor. So you've alluded to my question just for the last one, but if you had this magic wand <laughs> That's dangerous. Short, short of outlawing, outlawing white male Christians to participate in political politics. I don't think I would. <laughs> yeah. but short I don't of think that, that's a path to democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But would you change campaign finance laws? Would you do away with the electoral process? Would you mm. do away with voter ID restrictions? Would That's you great. change the Supreme Court and enlarge it? What, or would you do away with the tenure system? What is the one thing that we could do? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and again, if I, had a, if I had a smart answer to that question, I'd have a much more high status job than I do. Um, I, guess, I guess two things. Um, so money in politics, campaign finance rules are a huge problem for American democracy. They're not, I don't think, the main cause of the problem that I, um, that I focused on here. There are, there are many ways to die, and there are many ways to have a dysfunctional democracy. Uh, 
and I haven't talked much about money in politics, I actually think it's a huge problem that is, that's undermining the quality of, of our democracy. So if I, could, if I could have two wands and two hands and wave one of them, it would, it would be for far-reaching campaign finance reform to reduce the impact of money on politics. That would not solve the problem that I'm alluding to today. The other thing I would do would, um, with the other hand, is make it radically easier to vote. 90% I, I, of our electorate should be voting. It should, we should be voting on Sunday, everybody should be automatically registered, and the government should be taking steps not to make it harder to vote, but to encourage people to vote. In fact, I'm in favor, this, this kind of goes against my libertarian instincts, but I'm in favor of a law that makes it obligatory to vote. I think it should be a duty for citizens to vote. And again, I don't think that would end the problem that I'm focusing on, but if 90% of Americans as opposed to 55, 58, 59% of Americans were voting, I think we would have healthier outcomes. We have a question in the balcony. That what? In the Senate, yes, not in the House. So we'll continue this afterwards. Okay. One more question upstairs. Um, in the late 60s, one of the anti-communist um, activists in Poland, ironically, uh, wrote in his uh, memoirs looking at the uh, uh, United States that uh, the biggest enemy of democracy is democracy itself. Do you agree with this statement? Uh -huh. The biggest enemy of, of democracy is democracy itself. Interestingly, when the, uh, the McGovern Fraser Commission uh, published its report calling for binding primaries in the United States, uh, which I don't oppose, but I think has been double-edged, they, they, they made the opposite argument, which is that the, the, the cure for democracy's ills is always more democracy. Um, I think the answer is somewhere in between. I, I think that we live in a representative democracy, which means that um, voters choose representatives, but there's a role, an important role, we don't like to say this because we live in a populist era, but there's a role for political elites. There's a role for political parties, for elected politicians to govern and to govern um, apart from the short-term desires of voters. So one, one thing we don't see much, so I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of democracy, but again, we live in a representative democracy where we, we should be able to freely and fairly elect our governments, but then governments need to be allowed to govern. One, one problem of, one sort of symptom of, of, in a sense, too much democracy in the United States today, and I, this is getting filmed and I'm gonna get whacked for this, um, is that politicians are unable or unwilling to stand up to voters. Why couldn't Republican leaders say to their voters, we, we can't go here, we can't go there. This guy's a demagogue, this guy is unfit for office. They couldn't do it. They couldn't stand up to their own base. Dem I fear that Democratic politicians today, in the, in the two years ahead of us, there is going to be a push from the Democratic Party base to rain hell upon the Trump administration if the Democrats get control of, of Congress. Um, and it, it in, you know, there, there, there may well be circumstances in which it, impeaching Donald Trump is the right thing to do, but we don't know that yet. And, um, and as I said, it's very, very important, I think, for the Democratic Party to continue to uphold our precious Democratic norms and not basically follow the leadership of the Republican Party and spiral out of control. The base is going to be calling for blood. The Democratic Party base is going to be calling for blood. And the, the best thing for democracy is for some Democratic Party leaders to say, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't go there. Um, that's, that's, that's elite leadership, and that's something that has been in deficit in the last couple of, of decades in the United States. I don't know if that answers your question. It pains me to say that we are all out of time today. Let's get another round of applause for our speaker today. Thank you very much. His book is for sale in the lobby and he'll be signing books up on the second floor.
Thank you for attending today and please enjoy the rest of the festival.